We got a yes. big, huge uh, movie star. Yes. Waiting to come in. Absolutely. Why is he still sitting out there? I know. Why are you still sitting out there? Get this You're like, on. what? Gunny. Gunny. <laughs> Gunny. Bring in Gunny. Here he is. Hoorah! 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 Here's Gunny. How's everybody doing this morning? Great. Fantastic now. I'm, I'm proud of you guys. Satellite radio is is the the rage of the age. I have it in, in both of my cars. And uh, what are you on? What I kind of cars? Wouldn't trade it for anything. What kind of cars? You I got the Willys? I, you know, I've, I'm rich and I've never bought a new car in my life. I'm just too conservative. Is I, that it? I have an 80, 86 uh, Mercedes SEC that I'm customizing, and it's. Uh, I have a, another 450 SL uh, Mercedes, uh, that's, Mercedes 80, uh, that's a 77. Yeah. Wow. But I like the old cars. You I like don't the like older the, ones? The new ones are all plastic. You do, know that. What do you yeah. listen on, uh, to on XM? Everything. Everything? Everything. You check out Dylan's show yet? Uh, don't know. You have to understand that my time in the car is pretty yeah, limited, yeah. you know, and it's from L.A. And, uh, from I live in Palmdale, west of Palmdale, not in the desert. And, uh, and why would he listen to that goddamn hippie? So what I what I generally tune into is uh, uh, drive time talk uh, uh, political shows right, right, because yeah. I need to stay abreast of what's going on politically. Yeah, I love uh, watching mail call. It's one of my favorites. It's you one of my favorites too. Letters, but you get to do some stuff that I mean. Dream come true. It's the coolest job in the world. I I was telling the guys out there in the in the green room just a while ago that Monday I spent the entire day down in Tennessee uh, flying a P fifty one Mustang oh. and dog fighting and doing barrel rolls and it was a nineteen forty five vintage P fifty one. What a what a fantastic day! A that mail call is episode. Such. Nothing came up. You oh, absolutely not. I no. don't do that. You no. don't throw up. You <laughs> throw up. It's all mind over matter. I don't blow chunks. You know, uh, it's, it would be an embarrassing situation. If it I would did. Be. I've done the F-15. I've done, you know, so many different airplanes and every helicopter in the military's arsenal. And if I blew chunks, I that no, would be embarrassing. They wouldn't invite me back. No, you know? we got to introduce you to Bob Kelly because this I guy. All you have to Hi, Bob. S- all you have to say is whatever, and he'll puke. Yeah, well, he's got I, a weak stomach. Worst. I did. I did the Mustang in California for a thousand bucks. Marine pilots will take you up six thousand feet and give you the stick. And, and Torgasm. There you go. Yeah. Uh, you, oh, that you, was the plane you flew in Torgasm? Yeah, you, ba- okay. you basically, you, 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 you dig, they go, go ahead. I mean, they're still there. Of course they're the, there. You know, you're just uh, doing In the, your case, I wish they would have jumped out with a chute. <laughs> <Like, can you laughs> well, they actually, it's easy to you, fly, though. It's very easy yeah. to fly, but literally at 6,000 feet, he goes, you do this to the stick, the plane goes like that, and I, as, you don't puke, it, when you come back level and you see the horizon... And you, you're still doing this yeah. after doing four Gs. I I, I threw up twice. I filled up both oh, bags. Uh, they changed my call sign to uh, snacks to two bags. <laughs> now you know why they charge a thousand dollars. It probably cost half that to get somebody to clean a mess <laughs> Just up. To clean it. <laughs> clean the chunks out of the. <laughs> my wife is uh, is prone to seasickness, car sickness. Uh, she you can't even drive across a, a bridge without her getting sick. No, I got sick no. in a, a Chinook when I, I went to Iraq. To do some comedy, and they take you up in the Chinook helicopters, I think they're oh. called, with the yeah. uh, the 50 cals in the window, the open. Uh, uh, I got old school. I'm sure Gunny spent uh, enough time in some Chinooks. Chinooks, uh, uh, beef, uh, uh, the 46 is my favorite, the OCH 46. It's uh, being replaced right now with, with the Osprey. Hey, mm-hmm. you see what's going on here, by the way? Bob yeah. Kelly's trying to make his puking sound cool. Uh, yeah, he's trying yeah. to toughen up his throwing yeah. up in front of Gunny. I was at 6,000 feet. You you saw a woman that <laughs> you had drove a, up like a man. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Let me explain though. This week alone, we had a fat girl come in with a hernia sticking out of her belly button. He puked. Yeah, he threw up when he looked at it. Yeah, so, yeah I, mean, it could, well, I don't know. I might kind of have a little problem with that myself. It was I a herniated. Know. You could see the food pulsating. Through. Oh, oh beautiful! I actually saw her. Her <laughs> twin. Losing. Her twin winked at me <laughs> through the hernia. It was like disgusting. watching a horror show. <laughs> Speaking of horror. Shows. Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, look she is at a him. professional. Yep. We have Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the beginning coming out this Friday, or excuse me, uh, next Friday. 
uh, the on the sixth, mm-hmm. and and uh, as no, you know, most the first see, one most remake. Re- that was great. Most, the remake was great. I was a little skeptical uh, about doing the remake because the first one was such a kick butt. Yeah. You, know, you know, and I was a little nervous about that. And I read the script, and and we actually were able to make a better movie than the, the original movie. So it turned out great. And then he came up with the proposition that we should do a prequel. And I was extremely skeptical about that simply because almost every prequel that you see or sequel that you see is riding on the coattails of the original, mm-hmm. which was a fantastic show. And and then the studios throw together a bunch of crap and expect to shove it down your throat. And you can't stand to sit through more than about 15 or 20 minutes before you leave the theater. Yeah, uh, I'm proud to say that uh, I was giving... Uh, creative license and we were able to uh, just make it better and better and better the script was good to begin with but before we did each scene every morning when I would come in I would sit down with the director and the producers and and uh, the, who whichever other actors might be in the scene we would throw we would put on the table everything that we had and we would throw ideas back and forth until we thought we had the best the scene as tight and as good as we could possibly make it Look then we you. shot it you Look know at you. Just the, I think the, an and they tell me that the uh, the show is better, uh, and I I watched it. I've seen it three times, and I'm here to tell you that the actually the remake or excuse me the uh, uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre the beginning is better than the the remake was. I heard that too. Uh, now the here. Yeah, that's it, the buzz on the. I, I read a bunch of stuff on the internet about it, like this week actually. And it's it, really gruesome. It said it's better than the first gruesome. one. They just did, yeah. A it's a little show, bit. Well, it's, it's like hard to yeah. clean up a. Te- you know, you got somebody with a chainsaw. It's yeah, a little yeah. rough cleaning that mess. Up, uh, the know? idea of a prequel is pretty good too to see where you guys came from and how you got so screwed up. What we do is, you know, in the in the remake, we had Uncle Monty in his little wooden uh, wheelchair yeah. uh, cruising around with no legs. How that happened? Yeah, you know, know what happened that to happened. Uncle Monty's legs? And uh, the sheriff, uh, Sheriff Hoyt, my character, uh, has no teeth in front. His teeth have been knocked out. How'd that happen? Uh, matter of fact, if you want to go there, how in the hell did he ever become a sheriff? This guy's uh, yeah, a bit a little, sick, you know. Crazy. He's a little off the off the off the knot yeah, there a little character. bit, but he's crazy as hell. And how did he become a sheriff? And where did Leatherface come from? Mm-hmm. Did a did a crow crap him out on a rock in the sun hatch him or what? You know, I, I'll tell you where he came from. He came from a female's body, and uh, he was born, and uh, and then uh, Sheriff Hoyt took him under his wing and gave him good guidance and leadership, and he turned out to be such a fine. He didn't take him under a porch when it started raining out. Uh, actually, uh, <laughs> a- actually, uh, uh, he was a very protected, guarded individual. Now, how he was special. I, I, I just got to ask you about uh, a little bit of your history and stuff. How did you get into acting? What 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 went from the military? Uh, to acting, how did how did eleven you pull years in the Marine Corps? I was a grunt. I was an instructor most of my uh, most of my tenure in the Marine Corps, and uh, uh, got hurt in Vietnam. Got retired out. I kept showing up for work, but they did retire me. And I've been with the Marine Corps for forty five years. I, wow. I'll be with the Marine Corps till I die. I've been to uh, the uh, Far East uh, or the Middle East uh, three times, two weeks at a time. Uh, the Marine Corps gives me a couple of helicopters and CH-46 as a rule. And off into the combat zone I go. I wear the uniform, the, the black jacket, yeah. Kevlar helmet. I, I, I've seen on Mail Call and, and other shows where you're in the Middle East, you're you're with the troops. and the Are you... Are you surprised and flattered of the the respect that you get from these soldiers? Because you do. No, they... I've, I've earned that respect. I, I'm part of the Marine Corps. Uh, uh, I take great pride in in serving. Uh, I'll never let them down. I'll always be there for them. Nothing quite like jumping up on the hood of a Humvee out in the middle of the combat zone and getting the troops to laugh I at mean, your corny jokes, you know. The, the way they treat you, though, is like you got stars on your shoulders. That's, uh, that's how they like I, it. I don't know. It, because everybody knows me. I spend about 200 days a year with the military, you know. And, and so these guys all know me, and they respect me because I treat them as they should be treated mm-hmm. with respect. And... Uh, uh, how did I get started? I found myself uh, retired, standing outside the gate of the Marine Corps Recruit Depot in San Diego with my sea bag at my side, and that's all I owned in this world, thinking, what the hell am I going to do now because I have no education to speak of? And then I thought, you know, Hollyweird is just up the road, <laughs> 40 miles. I can go to Hollyweird. I wrote a script, and I was a good instructor. 
And in order to keep uh, tired recruits, a thousand recruits awake and, and laughing at your corny jokes, you know, you've got to be pretty on your toes. So anyway, I was a good instructor. I figured, what the heck? I wrote a script. I went to Hollywood, and I did the comedy clubs for a year. I was up there doing comedy. Comedy. And uh, <laughs> God helped the individual that heckled. The, <laughs> yeah, you know, he just down in his face. <laughs> Talk about drive something up the wrong side of your body. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that worked out good. Uh, and then one of my buddies, and I was sleeping on people's couches, and <laughs> YMCA was good. But, uh, wow. Uh, and I didn't have a car. Couldn't afford a car. But... Uh, uh, a friend of mine told me, hey, Gunny, they're getting ready to do Vietnam War shows over in the Philippines. So I, I was single. I packed my gear and packed up my little sea bag and jumped on space available at George Air Force Base and went back to the Philippines, met the right people, and got involved. And that's it's, rest of its history. And that uh, movie was... Full Metal Jacket. Oh, of, course of course it was. You're talking Full Metal Jacket. <laughs> of course that was it mo- was. That was film number five, by the way. Was it? That was film number five. And, and in a previous film, I had taken, uh, I was technical advisor. Oh, Boys and, and I, Company C. Yeah. I think it was before. Boys yeah, and Company that was C, before. Purple Heart, Siege of Fire, Base Glory. Yeah. It goes on. But uh, I was able to take a role away from an actor, and they sent his young, put him on the airplane, sent his young tail back to Hollywood, and I did his I did his shtick. I must have been very uh, so impressed. I knew, yeah. I, I knew you could take roles away from actors. Now, as I, 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 since you weren't an actor uh, walking into that, but you had done stand-up, wasn't that just a one-shot of you going around the troops at the beginning, giving your speech? I don't remember seeing a cut, and you had a oh, lot yeah, of dialogue a, there. Want to hear it? I yeah. don't oh, wow. doubt. I'll, you could, I'll, I'll give you the look. clean version. No, no we you can satellite. Oh, you're okay with the bet? With the you can say anything whatever you, want to say. you want. Okay, this is not family family related. No, uh, la- uh, it, it it gets nasty. Okay, <laughs> yeah. here you go. I am Gunnery Sergeant Ermy. I am your senior drill instructor. From now on, you will speak only when spoken to. The first and last words out of your filthy sewers will be, "Sir, do you maggots understand that?" Yes, yes sir. sir. Bullshit! I can't hear you. Sound off like you've got a pair. Yes, yes sir. sir. If you ladies leave my island, if you survive recruit training. You will be a weapon. You will be a minister of death praying for war. But until that day, you are pukes. You are scumbags. You are the lowest form of life on earth. You are not even human fucking beings. You are nothing but a lot of little unorganized, grabastic pieces of civilian shit. My orders are to weed out all non-hackers who do not pack the gear to serve in my beloved corps. There is no racial bigotry here. Here we do not look down on niggers, kikes, wops, or greasers. Here you are all equally worthless. Is that understood. Yes, yes, sir. Sir. There you wow. go. That's, wow. just oh, that's just stairway to heaven. That's just stairway to heaven. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, that's the first time himself. I've done that in about a year. I was going to To see <laughs> you do that though live is like, yeah, Zeppelin. That's <laughs> watching Led Zeppelin do stairway. Yeah. My favorite line in, in the entire movie was something that I came up with. I lost my way, and I'm not the type of guy that will just stop. I'll continue until I get back on track and then finish the, the scene. But my favorite line was, uh, came out of nowhere, and it was, Ella looked like the kind of person that would fuck a person in the ass and not even have the goddamn common courtesy to give him a reach around. I'll be watching you. <laughs> and Stanley Kubrick jumped off the camera truck and said, Lee... What's, what's a reach around? <laughs> Use your imagination, oh, Stanley. Damn. Poor that Stanley. Good. But that was that was a tremendous show. I enjoyed doing I loved doing that show and I wrote most everything that I did in the show. Yeah. And uh Texas Chainsaw Massacre uh, I was allowed to do a lot of ab living. So, Great. uh, the first, uh, the sheriff, the first time I did the sheriff in the first Texas Chainsaw Massacre, there really wasn't anything written for the sheriff. So I had to basically come up with almost everything that we did. And it got to the point where we would do the scene the way that it was written. Then the director would say, okay, Lee, do, you do one. And yeah, they would let me do mine, and it was always mine that showed up in the show. Well, that's so what people want to see, you know. It, that's what they want to see out great. of you. It worked out great, and and I got to tell you guys, if uh, if uh, the beginning Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the beginning wasn't better than the the last one, I would not be sitting here. Okay, I recommend it. It's it's a great show. Great man, bring your barf bag. It's a bit hard. Yeah, there you go. That's for you. <laughs> Is it, I we had a fifteen. We had over a fifteen million dollar budget, and they tell me half of that was spent on stage blood. 
<laughs> now is is it <laughs> nice is and it, gruesome? Good. I know it's yeah. gruesome, but is it is it scary? I mean, is it like At I mean, Leatherface was, was like, oh man, this guy's coming. There's a couple things we would, that that really bother us uh, psychologically. One is we would never want to be eaten by an animal, such as a white shark or a uh, tiger. Right. You know, you'd be attacked and and eaten by an animal. That's that sucks. Pretty you know, horrific. That, that really sucks. Yeah. And and the other thing is being cut by a damn chainsaw. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. Just the sound of that, that thing cranks up. And yeah, you know, it's not a clean wound. No, no, it's yeah. it's a ripping thing. That's you know, the shot, the, the, a, a chainsaw had been cutting wood, it's not sharp. No, yeah. no. Okay. Well, I, I'm looking forward to seeing it because uh, the first one, like I said, was great. You know but. what else is scary, though? A cop, a man with a badge who's psychotic. That's what scares me. A cop, because you, you yeah. know, as soon as you see him, you trust them. That's a cop. You just, You're going to save me. But then to find out he's a fucking lunatic. And he can do what he wants. And he's impunity, bringing to his yeah. creepy son. Yeah. Now it's like, oh, I'm fucked. That's yeah, my one. my guy, the sheriff is. Uh, I I think Sheriff Hoyt is uh, is the second most uh, favorite part that I I've ever done. Really, I really enjoy him. You know. So many, I take every role that I do, and I've done 75 feature films, and, and every every role that I've ever done, yeah. every, every character, I always take it, push it to the limit. I try to get it right up where it, he, he doesn't go over the edge, but he's right up to the limit. Mm -hmm. Nothing aggravates me more than a director saying, take it down, bring it down a couple of notches, and uh, uh, less is Less is more, yeah. which we know is a crock of shit. Less is not more. Yeah. I don't know how who came up with that, but they're full of crap. Guy with a small dick. Yeah, I guess that. <laughs> yeah, guy, somebody guy is sexually yeah, insecure. Yeah. There you go. The but, guy you're stealing the scene from. <laughs> but this guy with the big one knows where to go, you know. Yeah. And the beautiful thing about uh, Sheriff Hoyt is. God, he's a sexually perverted homicidal maniac. There is no over the damn top with yeah. this guy, and they just let me go berserk, and I have a great time doing him. He's fun. That's he's fine. Looking forward hey, to seeing it. Mm. Can, can we ask you about your ring? Yeah, I'm looking at that diamond. I can't take my eyes off. That would be the mother of all Marine Corps rings. Wow, <laughs> yeah. There, I went to the P. My old ring I wore on my right hand. That's my change pocket, and I wore the emblem off of it over the years. And about 10 years ago, my wife asked me what I'd like for Father's Day. And I said, well, I pretty much need a new ring. We looked all over the PXs and uh, couldn't find... They were the common, usual, not-so-cool rings. Mm -hmm. And so I sat down and I made a couple of sketches and gave her a pat on the butt and sent her off to the jewelry store. And she had this guy make this thing. It turned out... A little bit larger than what I had in mind. <laughs> <laughs> on paper. I told you what you know it. no, It's the you? Super Bowl ring of the Marine Corps. Yeah. <laughs> for you, you're bigger than life, How so many, you ought to have a big ring. You but if you're secure in your masculinity, a man can wear jewelry, you know. That's yeah. true. How many carrots? Uh, I don't want to see a diamond. That's uh, four carats. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. You have, but but it, it didn't just... Uh, it Get wasn't the jewelers born, loop it, out of your eye, Rich. It <laughs> wasn't born being four carats. It was actually, when it originally was made, it was a half carat. And then every year, every Father's Day thereafter, my wife would take it and take it down to the jewelry store and kick it up a notch, you know? <laughs> and I do the same for her. So it was an investment, basically. Yeah. Over 10 years, it's evolved wow. into a four carat diamond from a half a carat. Do you have Beautiful. kids? Do you have kids? Uh, well, you, you could call them kids. Uh, they're, they're old imagine, kids. They're, they're all over 20. Imagine more. him being your dad, though. Having to wake up, you're late for school in the morning. <laughs> I don't want to go. Get you your just fuck fucked up, boy. Look, it's worse like Great Santini. Gonna, like yeah. it's yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah, the Great Santini done it so much better than I did, though. You know, I I was kind of a failure when it come to being a father, simply because I was just gone all the time. Uh, and so I would come home. I would be home for a few days, just long enough to get him squared away, uh, get the baggy pants off the boy, and get. The skateboard away from him, and, and the next thing you know, I'd be on the airplane going away. I'd come home, and the wife would have taken him shopping by then, and he had all brand new baggy pants. You know, oh, yeah, she was a pushover, and and I was the disciplinarian. But problem was, the disciplinarian was always gone. Yeah. So what are you gonna do? Did you make him, Did you make him cut his hair? Did he? Did he have to have a short haircut? Uh, they they uh -oh. were pretty neat up until uh, the probably when they were 16, 17 years old, and the hair is growing. My son has a lot of hair right now, <laughs> and 
I, I, I point that out to him occasionally. Yeah. He has too much hair. Do, doesn't seem like you're very doesn't, happy about it. Yeah, uh, but so yeah. be it. You know, yeah. it doesn't do anything. He's obviously... Obviously, he doesn't have enough respect for me to go cut his hair. So I'll, oh, one of these days, geez. I'll have to come home with a couple of big guys, take him down, and just cut that dog shit. Oh. <laughs> Butcher his ass. You know? <laughs> Teach him a lesson. Yeah, I hear you. I'm sure that'll oh, work. Damn. It's great. Wow. <laughs> He'll love me forever. Yeah, don't hold back, man. <laughs> you, can, yeah, you right? can speak freely. Did here. you hate, I mean, after you were done doing stand-up, were you glad? I mean, compared to acting, I mean, did you... Did you just hate the world around Stan? More money. Yeah, yeah. A lot more money. That's that's the only difference. I, I love doing stand up. It's fun. And it's instant uh gratification. recognition, gratification. Yeah, yeah Rich. That, and and what was you, better, uh, a chuckle hut or a full metal jacket? No, no, well, you know uh, No, no, no. But <laughs> well, the thing is the movies saying. go on and on and on, you know, and like <laughs> Full Metal Jacket, you know, we did that twenty years ago. I know, it's amazing. And it still goes strong today. There's I, not a day goes by what I don't sign a, a number of copies of Full Metal yeah. Jacket. I did a I did a thing for the something. troops called Full Metal Comedy. Mm. Where oh, I, I just, went over there. Oh, you just I, compared yourself Are you insane? You, insane? Compare yourself to a legend, you fucking blimp. <laughs> How dare go puke in the bathroom, you oh, jackass. God. Put your fucking put your midget hand down. <laughs> point to me with that finger. You use your elbow if you're going to point to me. No I, I have a here. concept to throw up to you here. Yeah. Uh, see what your opinion is. Now, we've done two Texas Chainsaw Massacres. Probably are. Uh, chances are we will do a, a sequel to the prequel. Uh, and I was thinking, you know, last right in the middle of the last show, I was I was starting to dribble and droodle and write and, and think about ideas. I think a huge, tremendously successful show would be a spoof on Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And I was thinking about I would name it. It would be a, a musical, comedy musical. And it would be I would call it uh, New York Hacksaw Manicure. You know, don't you? Could you just are imagine? You, are, uh, all right, who's going to do it? Well, Sergeant, do it. Uh, <laughs> you can imagine Sheriff Hoyt and, and, uh, and Leatherface up there dancing around like a couple of fairies. To, you know, <laughs> what happened? <laughs> you start up the. Why don't you yell at him, boss? Uh, you angry little Jew. First of all, <laughs> yell at him. Just, first of all, he just that, said hey, something about a manicure. So he maybe he made the right decision decision with acting. But here's the thing: he could take that ring and put a dent in my head. If <laughs> And he, right and he should. And he should. The other right. day, a fly. There was. I was watching news in a hotel room, and there was a damn fly, and it landed on my head, and not even thinking, I I hit that fly, and it nearly knocked me out. I saw stars for about a minute after that. You know? oh, <laughs> but but this ring is a lethal weapon. I have yeah. to be very careful with that. You know. God damn. Well, <laughs> my I, point I, was with that uh, that thing is that n back then you you say now comics actors uh, comics make more money now because if you go actors are actually turning into comics. Dane Cook you can go on, you can makes go on, more money you, now. You know how much money Stop he'd make comics. doing stand up if he he could fill a, he could fill a club. I mean, he'd make uh, thirty thousand a night. But it's only the few. Up. You know, it's only the few. It's the Eddie Murphys and the Whoopi uh, Goldbergs, and it's like you know, only a few of the comics really do make the big bucks. No, all the rest of them are stuck on Saturday Night Live <laughs> making one hundred and fifty a week. No, yeah. I mean, you yeah, know, that's back my point. in the old days, there was bit. no money. I got paid a hundred bucks a stand up when I was doing stand up. And what do you the, make, Rich? The, where was that? Where that's good? Hundred bucks to stand up. Are you talking? Who, who are you talking to? I'm Rich Voss. Do you know Rich Voss? Do you, do you know Rich Voss from Did last you comic standing? From last comic standing, a tough crowd with Colin Quinn. Yes, I watch. Yeah. Do, you, do you know him from it? If, if you no. seriously, if you recognize, just walk in the street, me or him, who do you think you would recognize more, me or the or? I, I wouldn't recognize either one of you. <laughs> good, good answer. Thank, Thank God. You, sir. And I'm so glad you, Norton sir. isn't here. I'm so glad Jimmy Norton isn't here because it would upset himself. me if you did recognize Jimmy. And but, Jimmy but is the, a big fan. The tough Huge part fan. is, you know, there's a lot of... Uh, of uh, actors that are doing uh, singing now, you know yeah. they're, they're going to singing. Of course, if you have a hit record, you make money. Mm -hmm. But you can sing all damn day and not have a hit record, and you're not going to make beans. You know, yeah. it's like writing that book. You first of all have to make back the thirty-five thousand dollar advance they gave you before you make a penny. Well, I wrote a book about three years ago, and I haven't. I've, the advance is all I saw. That and, was it. That was it. You know, and it's a good book, and they sold a bunch of copies. But you just what it's it got to be Harry Potter, you know, in order to make yeah. money on it. What was it about? Called Mail, called the book. 
and it was I took a bunch of the old scripts and I, I hate to waste my time and I'm sitting on the airplane five hours going from LA to New York and from New York to LA and Seattle and, and uh, Washington DC and I'm wasting my time and I, so I got all the old scripts from mail call and and uh, I went back, and all the research was done already. So I went back, and I I just did uh, I did a book. Yeah. I wrote a book and uh, changed everything, of course, uh, as far as dialogue and the way it works. But um, pictures, put some pictures in there, and, and I wrote a book, and, and they've sold thousands of copies. I know I've done book signings, and I've sold at least ten thousand copies of the book. But you didn't see? Uh, no, I haven't seen the a dime. I haven't seen a dime. You, you got to sell a million. You, you know? need a biography. Wow. And, and the problem. The biggest problem is uh, with these actors that are going into, like, stand-up, for instance, okay? It should be the other way around because from stand-up, you go into acting, and there's where the big bucks is. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, unless you are the, the main guy on the ticket, you don't make any money. You know, you get the audience warmed up. You know yeah. as well as I do. You've been there, did that. Yeah, I've been there. I've been the, there. Yeah, you no. know, you go and warm up Still the audience there. for, for Eddie there. Murphy, and what do you get? You get 250 bucks, yeah, 300 I, bucks. And the fat chick. <laughs> yeah, and the fat chick. That's it. But uh, and the fat drunk chick. <laughs> you should definitely write a book. A, bi- a biography. Yeah, a biography. Be- you're, you're, you're in Vietnam, you said, right? Well, I'm going to write a biography, but I'm not done yet. God. Yeah, I know, right? He's and not I'm done. I'm still young. I want to wait until I get well, old. Don't you want to have the money? No, then I want to sit around and write a book, you know? Yeah. yeah. Can I ask you a question? I want to wait. Actually, I want to wait until my da- dad dies because I have a lot of really filthy, nasty things oh, to say about him. And I don't want to have to do it while he's still alive. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> oh, He's worried about his dad, not his Sorry wife or his that, kids. Dad. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell one story for us. You gotta uh, have something. No, yeah. I, you know, my dad had me totally convinced when I was a kid uh, that my, my I thought my name was s- stupid. You know, and oh, until shit. I went in the Marine Corps, and they pointed out the fact that my my first name was Ronald, my middle name was Lee, and last name was Army. I thought it was just stupid. Army. Oh no, really. Yeah, he had, he had all of us totally, I mean, you know, you don't call yourself, hey, idiot, come here. Well, that's my father, okay, in his drunken stupor. Uh, so it was like, uh, that's what I put up with, and that's what I was convinced by the time I got in the Marine Corps, that I was a total loser, a total idiot. And it, uh, thank God for my three drill instructors, they pulled me out of that ditch, cleaned me off, and, and hosed me down, and, and put me in the right direction and convinced me that there wasn't much in this world that I couldn't accomplish if I set my mind to it. Is that what drove you into the Corps? Like your, your oh, I, I was, was in the Marine Corps the the day I was 17. I was on the bus, man. I was wow. getting the hell out of Dodge, yeah. Uh, I grew up on a, a, can, a farm in Kansas, a little farm. And my dad was uh, my dad was an alcoholic tyrant. And uh, he had six boys. That might have a little something to do with why he was an alcoholic tyrant, you know? Six boys. Wow. Ooh, can you imagine? One year apart. They, he, I guess, mom and he didn't figure out what caused that, you know, until it was way too late. Six kids later, they figured out how that happens. Mm. So, uh, and 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 on the farm back in the early fifties, we didn't have electricity. So, well, hell, when it got dark, you went to bed. Well, what do you do when you go to bed? You make babies, right? So he's got to have some entertainment <laughs> and have TV doing. back in those days. It's just screwing <laughs> is all you had to do. <laughs> just go screw your brains oh, out. Wow. Just go to bed. Come on, baby. Let's go to bed. Make, oh. make another baby. Yeah, and I'm, uh, My first wife was, oh, Jesus, again? <laughs> Didn't we just do this last week? Excuse me. We have but are television. you abnormally oversexed? <laughs> Jeez, baby. Oh. Yeah. So you talk to your father now? Uh, my dad's okay. He and I can't be in the same room for much more than 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, he and I believe uh, we're differently politically. We're different. Uh, he he is one of these Democrats that uh, is totally 100% a Democrat, and I don't have a problem with that. But what I do have a problem with is, is why are you a Democrat? Uh, I ask him, uh, you can ask him who is the president of the United States. He can't tell you. He don't know who the vice president is. Uh, he voted for, uh, the Democrat on the ticket. He can't tell you who that guy, what that guy's name was. And he can't tell you what he believed in or what he stood for. Uh, all he knows is that back in the fifties, the Democrats were union men and he's a union man. And the reason he, he got decent pay when he worked for the 
the railroad was because they they went on strike and the Democrats backed them up, the unions and and wow. uh, for as far as he's concerned, he goes into the po- uh, poli- uh, the booth, the uh, voting booth. He and his wife and his wife is instructed and she's a yes lady. And they go in and they punch everything with a D beside it. They will not listen to uh, if they see something. A uh, political person on TV that might be talking about, I'm running for president, and, and I would like to have your vote, and this is what I stand mm-hmm. for. Blink, he changes the channel. He didn't want anything to do with it. How crap. old a gentleman is he now? He's 82, and he's not a gentleman. Don't 82. make that mistake. Okay. I was being <laughs> respectful. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. I'm an ass. Uh, no sense in being respectful. He's he's okay, but he and I get along fine now because I can kick his ass. <laughs> 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 but uh, it was a hard it was a hard time growing up and I was number two I had an older brother and then I was number two and number two is always the guy that sucks iron tit you know eats the shit and I, wow. I was the guy that it was always my fault you know did you ever have that moment with your father where you finally crossed over like you've been in the core for a while and you came did you visit and then show him like listen motherfucker no I had to I'm beat him at arm wrestling Oh, was that, that it? Was, yeah, that was the only I, way I got I the upper hand. I was picturing some big dramatic scene of you yeah. taking your hat off and, come on, yeah. hit me. Yeah, when I pinned him, I, and then I looked him straight in the eyes and said, and, and, and now you have some kind of an idea about what I might be able to do to you if you fuck with me anymore, you cocksucker. Oh, wow. <laughs> yes, Uncomfortable. Yeah. But, oh, uh, but, but, he got, but he came around. Dad, <laughs> Dad's not a bad guy. I yeah. get along okay with Dad now, but we... Uh, we have an understanding, you know. I have my beliefs; he has his beliefs. I grew up in a democratic family, but I I'm uh, an independent. Yeah, I don't really agree with uh, everything that the Republicans do, and I certainly don't agree with what what the Democrats do. Uh, but you know, I'm one of those guys that I've remained independent so that I can look at the the individual and. I, I make up my mind, Jeez. you know, by yeah. by listening to what his ideas are, and I want I want to vote for the guy that's going to do the best thing he can for this country. Mm-hmm. What's pissed me off here lately is the Democrats and the Republicans. That seems to me like they've evolved into a situation where they they vote for what's good for the party, not what's yep. good for you and I or America, and that bugs me. Well, I just heard about the uh, senatorial vote on. Um, it was the. Uh, the bill for the prisoners. Uh, oh, now isn't that sweet? Now, what are we supposed to do? You know, they've exactly. got color TV and air conditioning. I, know. And, I mean, come on, Playboy so, magazines. What more do they need? And we need yeah. to we need to tie up these loose ends. Yep. I mean, what do we? You can't keep them in Gitmo for the rest of you know for the next hundred years. There was a Democrat. Don't remember the state or the name because I heard it on the way in. Uh, who actually voted for this bill? Uh, so during the next election, his competitor. Uh, the Republican can't run um, ads against him, saying he, re- you know, voted down the uh, t- anti-terrorism bill. He actually voted against what he wanted to do, just so the his the opponent guy wouldn't have ammo him. to shoot like, at him. Right? What the f- <clears throat> kind of guy? You, you vote yeah. for what you feel is supposed to be right. You think uh, that's you, what they're doing? You mean you vote with your heart? Would you be saying something like that? I would that? think some you would vote. Things what, that, yeah, some stupid thing like that <laughs> is like perhaps what you feel is best for the people that you're representing. Yeah. One that cracks me up is oh, Ted Kennedy. I oh, get the biggest kick out of him. job like a pope. I spent four weeks in Iraq. I uh, wore the uniform, I, the flak jacket, the Kevlar helmet. I was out in the field with the troops in the combat zone. We got stuck in firefights. We had uh, uh, shoulder uh, Imagine one of these motherfuckers. Just, I'm RPG sorry shot at us. Interrupt you for a second. Though, but could you imagine one of these Al Qaeda motherfuckers who just like watched one of his movies, going, "Holy shit, that's the fucking guy! I got, I just got shot by Arlie Army." <laughs> but anyway, I was over there for four, uh, four weeks, and I come back, and I mean, I see nothing but El Primo uh, morale was at uh, just going through the roof. And you have to understand, these kids are re-enlist, re-enlisting at the rate of seventy percent right now. Seventy percent, seventy out of a hundred of these kids that join re-enlist in the Marine Corps. So they re-enlist knowing damn well that they're going to go back to the sandbox and fight this war some more. Mm -hmm. Now, it tells me, that tells me that they must have tremendous faith in their leadership. And their leadership is George W. Bush and the administration and the generals that are in charge, the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Now, 
I came back uh, watching these kids. These kids were just fantastic. I mean, they're they stepped up to the plate and they're do, getting the job done. Things are happening over there. Trust me, we are winning this war, yep. big time. And I got back, and the first morning I'm, I jump out of the rack and I turn on TV, and here's Ted Kennedy saying, "The morale for our troops is at an all time low in Iraq." And you know what? I didn't see Kennedy over there any place when I was there. And here, <laughs> yeah, when, here he was. All I saw was great morale. And and all I hear from this jerk is morale is at an all-time low. You know, if if it was going to be at an all-time low, that would be exactly why right there. Because, you know, one unit doesn't have any idea what the morale is like uh, 50 miles away in another unit. It may be at an all-time low as right. far as this... As far as this unit knows. So, Ted Kennedy, somebody of authority in our government, a high prestigious individual, Been comes on and comes on and they hear him saying morale's all at an all-time low. The troops are thinking, gosh, maybe my unit's the only unit in Iraq that has great morale. Maybe everybody else's morale is at an all-time low. My God, maybe we should get our morale under control and get it back down where it should be. Well, I hope our military um, wouldn't listen to Ted Kennedy with much... Uh well, you know, but it's it's our elected officials, these yeah. people that are supposed to be, you know, no knowledgeable and intelligent and sharp. It seems to me like I'm not real pleased about uh, the administration. I mean, I I would have rather had somebody to vote for last time. Yeah, you know, for absolutely. President. I'm I, not I, I'm not I happy have, at all with uh, no, the way. No, I, Nick Bush Romney, I think, is brilliant. Have you listened to any of his stuff? Uh, no. You know, he's been talking and he's been on TV, and I th- he is the brightest. Most squared away patriotic individual that I have seen in government for years. And I'm thinking Nick, uh, Mick Romney might be the guy that we might want to look at next time. Of course, he's, I'm going to have to listen to him a lot longer, you know, and find out some background history and the That's whole ball. What people never seem to want to do is really take a look at both sides or, or listen to, uh, one guy's opinion if it isn't such a staunch a party line. If you it's don't believe be, the way right. they believe, they won't listen to you. Right. Yeah, yeah. well, I, I, of course, out in Hollywood, you know, we have a few of those out there that uh, liberal off the deep end. Oh, I, I don't yeah. mind. I, Barbara Streisand is one of my favorites who writes on oh, her blog uh, and lives in our gated house, uh, never yeah. goes out to see what the real world is all about. Yet she knows what solves everything, how everything should be run. That's where I'm different. Oh. I do get out in the real world. Yeah, I've been, you know, I've been that, half my life with the troops. I take I, you the know. word of somebody that's been around and under fire with the troops than I will any politician but or entertainer. I've found that. out that you're very polite and you will stand there, uh, uh, independent or Republican, will actually stand there and listen uh, while uh, a deep end, uh, far off the deep end on the left, uh, liberal uh, tells you all about how he feels about it, and this is the way mm-hmm. that I see it, and that, and then when it, and you'll listen to him for five or ten minutes doing his thing, and then when it comes your turn to explain how you feel about it, you get about one sentence into your explanation, and they cut you off. They literally will not listen to you. So. Uh, how can they make an opinion? They yeah. can't. You know? I, th- I think we have a problem like that, though, on both sides, uh, with the far right and the far left. You, we, I think uh, both sides, you get... I agree, but the, on the far left, it's worse. Yeah, it's well... Worse. And uh, they don't have they don't have a lot of common sense. I yeah, found that out. I, but I, well, that's you know, a, a, lot do, a lot of the talk shows just are kill gone. them all. <laughs> just, just kill, kill them all. Just line them up. <laughs> just, just, just dig a big old hole. You know, that's and, a, and a matter of fact, we could, we could make some something out of them and, and possibly build that wall down on our southern borders <laughs> with those bodies. You with know, the or bodies of the Nobody want to come near that stench and that fly mess and maggots. I love this guy. But, you know, no, that's another thing that cracks me up. Here we are faced with an invasion from the south, and I do mean an invasion. They've mm-hmm. closed down all the uh, – half of the emergency rooms in, in Southern California are bankrupt. They've closed them down. Yeah. Uh, and if you do have a problem, like I had a, a situation where I – I had a blood clot, and I was paralyzed on the left side, and I went to the emergency room. You realize that uh, out there the illegals are given free medical care only if they go to the emergency rooms. So if they so have a cold, they with. go to the emergency rooms. I took a number. I was number 87. 
um, and, and and I sat Christ. there and I waited and I waited and I waited and here was these little uh, Hispanic kids with the sniffles and you know that is ridiculous oh, and we need to do something about it but I have a solution and 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 it's the simplest thing in the world why not enforce the damn laws that we have on the books that says you can't hire them is anyone asking for anything more that isn't in place already it's like just it's, that's why it's called illegal I hear this, alien. I hear this illegal billion alien. dollar wall thing. What's up with this? I mean, come on. They dig holes, for Christ's sakes. Yeah. They have holes that they've dug under the border yeah. that are uh, a, a thousand feet huge long. Huge tunnels, yeah. Yeah, huge yeah. tunnels. And what's... Do you think a wall is going to stop them from no. tunneling? Uh, do you? What they need to do is... I did a show here last year, year before last. It was the blimp. And and they can take this blimp that they've they've come up with. It's a lighter than air type blimp. You can't shoot them down. You punch a hole in it. It it slowly leaks out, and it slowly you'll have to bring it home. Mm. Uh, but it doesn't just crash. Now they can take these blimps, and and they cost about a fourth or a tenth of what a helicopter would cost. Plus a helicopter, it's up there for three hours, and it has to come back and mm-hmm. get maintenance and refueled. Uh, this blimp can go up. You can put two crews on it. It can stay up there three days. It's got two little Piper Cub engines. It burns nothing for gas. You can put all the optical equipment and and uh, uh, heat registering. Uh, what do they call that? Red. Yeah, infrared. Infrared and all this. And it can see a hundred miles in each direction. Jeez. How many would we need? You know, and and that's all we really need to do is have somebody up there. We don't need to put more border patrols on. We just need to have that eye in the sky that mm-hmm. can be watching day and night. And when they see activity in one certain area, grid of the border, they call and let the border patrol know so that the border control can come and control it. Can control the border. <laughs> but uh, it would be the simplest thing in the world, wouldn't it? And, yeah. and they're talking about this multi-billion dollar wall. What's this big-ass 40 foot high concrete barrier that's uh that reminds me of the there was a, a similar situation between uh east and west berlin weren't yeah, there yeah then we didn't that like didn't that did very we? well we didn't like that too much well uh hopefully they'll consider that idea the blimp the blimp it's so <laughs> the blimp. simple it's just such an old idea yet it works it's just advertising simple. on the side like right the probably, probably they probably can sleep in it nike <laughs> the gondola <laughs> you know is, is on huge you can sleep in it yeah. there's quarter sleeping quarters so you can have Two crews up there and stay up there two days in a row. Not like a helicopter. Go out for three hours and come back. Yeah. Go out and come back. The the uh, people uh, the the people jumping across the borders are watching these helicopters. When they leave, they know well they are gone for a couple hours now. So we're wide open. Let's go, boys. Charge. Yeah, Blimp would be quiet. Yeah, Blimp yeah. is totally quiet. I say you fill a few up, up with the hydrogen like the Hindenburg and crash them right into the <laughs> well, we illegal just, aliens. We trying don't to... need to do that. But, but, <laughs> and another thing is uh, enforce the law. We have laws in the books that yeah. says you can't hire an illegal alien. But you can't hire You, any... you try to go over to another country, say Great Britain or, or France or any other civilized country. Why you go over the there and try to get a job. Would I want to do that? No, no, but, but try it. <laughs> yeah, you can't do Give it a that. Try. They won't let you you work, you know? Yeah, but the, uh, the Americans won't do the jobs that the Mexicans will do here, though. That's uh, the thing. No, no, no. Work. See, you it. have that I, wrong. You've heard, you've listened wrong. to Ted Kennedy too yeah. much. He says, He's my uncle. He says, yeah. Yeah, you got, he says you the that the shape. illegals <laughs> come across and they do the jobs that nobody, no Americans uh, will do. But he leaves off the last part. Two to, for two dollars and fifty cents yeah. an hour. Right. Of course, Americans will do those jobs, but you, you, not for two dollars yeah. and fifty cents an hour like the illegals will. Mm-hmm. You know that's the difference right there. So can now, you just go to a marine base and get a tank? Could no. you personally just go no. walk in and go? Could I get a tank? I want to drive. No, for a I while. could use one. Because that would I could probably go on any any marine base that has uh, has uh, Abrams A one battle tanks and, and, just and go, I could probably let me use one. Say, could we go for a ride? And they would be more than happy to <laughs> and the, load it the up. Fact maybe that you shoot have a couple that rounds, at you your know? disposal is hysterical. I love it. I love the fact they should just let every illegal know that that's possible. That Arlie <laughs> Ermy might be somewhere in a tank right now. <laughs> you? And then release tapes of this program uh, to them to let them know 
that you might be out there in a tank. <laughs> you know, I have all the respect in the world for the for the folks that have come over here legally, done the paperwork, yeah. and, and done it right. My son, my son married a Filipino. My wife is Filipina. And uh, I, I kind of was wanting him to, I was kind of pushing him in, in that direction. So he's been going on vacation with his mom for the past few years. And he finally fell in love with a family, old family friend. And, and uh, they got married in January. Do you realize that they're still working on her paperwork and they can't, they haven't been able to get her back? Yet. Wow! Now, and they're married. And they're married. So here, meanwhile, we have all the illegals flooding on board, and the big question is: Do we give them driver's licenses? Uh, do we give them education? Uh, well, you know, those yeah. are already decided things. Of course, we do. But how about my son's wife? That's yeah. what I'd like. They have to tunnels do. you can get her through. Did I you know should that? have done that. I should have just brought her to Mexico and just just whipped uh, whisked her across the border. You could probably just get a bunch of like some elite squad <laughs> rappel down, yeah. grab her up, <laughs> chop her back in. But, but it's the yeah. aggravating. It's just <laughs> aggravating yeah. to know that you know we're doing it the legal way because I insist there's no other way as far as I'm concerned. But in and meanwhile, we got all these people that are totally violating our laws the minute they step across our borders. Do uh, you realize that Vicente Fox, of course, has been dumping his garbage in our backyard ever since? Yep. He got So he's got a rapist, a three-time committer. What does he do? He doesn't commit him to prison because then, that, then the Mexican and... government has to feed him. Yep. Let's just... You are going to America, young man. There you go. And they escort him up to the up to the border, and he comes over here and rapes a few people over here. Have our criminals... Oh, yeah. criminals. They say a good, uh, like, 30% of the people in prison in California are illegal aliens. Come on, give me a break. Why are we supporting these? Why are we putting up with this crap? Give well, let's back. just raise taxes so we can give them all color TV and they're personalized. Oh, in it, rooms. Is, it is aggravating. Mm, it, it is. is aggravating. It's aggravating. There's so much wrong going on in this country, and it doesn't. And it seems like the Democrats and the Republicans, the left and the right, are doing everything they can. They're they're jockeying for that vote. They yep. want that illegal, that 12 million votes. Uh, yeah. And they're willing to sell us, the American people, out to get that 12 million votes. And it's disgusting. I'm starting to really get upset with them. But there's oh. some good things, too. You know, the government does a lot of great things. And I'm, I'm proud of our government. We do have the best government in the world. I've lived in a lot of foreign countries. And I'll tell you what, give me America and give yeah. me this government any day of the week. Just a few little... Problems. And Texas, that's Texas Chainsaw Massacre. And that's Massacre. what the movie is about. Right. Texas Chainsaw <laughs> Massacre. And that's what the Texas about. Chainsaw Massacre, guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Hey, my God. But, but I'm serious <laughs> about Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Yeah. It's better than it's better than the other one. And if you enjoyed the last one, which was a raging success, you need to go see this one. And and this one I get to go totally berserk in. So I would fun. I would I would get the DVD of the first one first and then go to the movies and see the second one. I would watch the, the prequel. The, yeah. the remake first yeah. too and then then you have all these questions you yeah. know well how'd this happen how'd that come about whatever happened yep. for this you know uh so i recommend that but by all means go and see texas chainsaw massacre on the big screen all right. sure. very good thank you yeah. so much it's been a pleasure to have you guys thanks for having me on board it's been a pleasure being R. here Semper Lee, Fi. y'all have a great rest of the day okay Hoorah. 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 No, we're off the air, too. Thank you, Arlen. Good to go. All right. Uh, Thanks, can we all guys. get pictures, or you got to run out of here? We can get pictures. All, all right. All right, cool. Jimmy, ready to get sad? I don't want to be sad, Opie. you got to be sad. Let us rub it in. Here we are, Semper Fi. This is Gunnery Sergeant R. Lee Army, United States Marine Corps, retired. And you are listening to my pal, Little Jimmy Norton, the scumbag El Primo. <laughs> <laughs> there you go, Jimmy. We didn't forget about you. Oh, that makes me happy. <laughs> How great is that? The scumbag El Primo. Do you know that should be my fucking... Can you get me that? Because that's my outgoing message from now on. Scumbag on El my phone. Primo. Scumbag El Primo. El Primo. Hoorah, Semper Fi, do or die, hold them high at 8th and I. This is going to restart in R. Lee Army. And you are listening to my pal, little Jimmy Norton. He is the kind of guy that would fuck a person in the ass and not even have the goddamn common courtesy to give him a reach around. Hoorah, leave your message. <laughs> That's the outgoing message. Isn't that great? It's fucking great. Hoorah! Semper Fi, do or die, hold them high at 8th and I. This is Gunner Sergeant R. Lee Ermey. Hey, you are listening to Opie and Anthony, and you best keep listening. Don't make me come over to your house, knock on your door, drop you down for 25, scumbag. <laughs> <laughs>
There you go. What was he saying? Something high, eighth and high. Like, those guys have such a lyrical way of oh, speaking. Oh, I know. Thank you for doing that, man. Uh, E-Rock or whoever did that. I love it. We'll talk to you a little job. later. <laughs> After we're done with one of the greatest film characters ever. <laughs> Arlie Ermey! Good morning, girls. Welcome back to the Opie and Anthony <laughs> Show, sir. It's always a pleasure. Last time you were here, we uh, we went deep with you, sir. Talking about uh, uh, your 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 uh, your upbringing and everything. Mm, well, that yeah, you know, uh, everybody's got a background. Everybody's got a history, right? Mm -hmm. My so, uh, so I don't have uh, anything to hide. Do you get sick of Full Metal Jacket? Like people questioning you on that, or as, like we did other stuff, like Mississippi Burning. Do you kind of wish people would concentrate on the other stuff you've done too? Well, uh, it just seems, uh, and there's no question about it. Uh, Full Metal Jacket uh, uh, lives on. The damn film just keeps going. It never stops. It just—it seems like it gets more popular. Uh, it's got ups and downs. You know, I—it's I, not a day goes by, but what I don't sign a couple of copies of Full Metal Jacket. Warner mm -hmm. Brothers told me it sold more film than any any uh, sold more DVDs and videos than any film they've ever done. Wow. <laughs> uh, so it's like it's a, a ritualistic film pass from father to son. We had uh, Matthew Modine was in, and he was saying that we didn't we didn't even know that you had a car accident or something as they were, as the filming of that was being done. Right in the middle of right in the middle of the uh, the shooting of Full Metal Jacket, I I uh, hit some black ice in Epping Forest, coming down a winding road in, in Epping Forest. And uh, slipped off the road, took out a took out a uh, a black walnut tree on the way, and ended up in the middle of a golf course. It totaled the car out and broke six ribs, a collarbone, dislocated my hip, and uh, let's see what the, uh, I guess that uh, that's about it. Oh well, it dislocated my shoulder, uh, my right shoulder as well. And you were still able to uh, get in there and uh, do the movie? It took me two months. I was uh, on the men for two months. And the first scene that we did when we came back from, uh, when, when we came back to, to shoot was the uh, obstacle course scene. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. And the first damn day that I was back, guess what? Vince the owner Frio pulled a hamstring. Oh, ho, oh, oh. ho. And we were off another goddamn week. <laughs> hey. And the uh, and the actors were going out of their minds. They all wanted to go home. You know, they're young guys. They they like to be home. So uh had a major mutiny on our hands, Stanley and I. Wow. But it worked out okay, and everybody was happy with the product, and, and seeing it was certainly worthwhile. Hey, guys, uh, the good folks at the History Channel came came to me with a project, uh, good idea, here uh, earlier this year. Uh, I want to talk about it, okay? It's uh, it's Take a Vet to School Day. Yeah, Take a Veteran to School. It's on yeah. the, It's going to be on the History Channel, right? Well, it's not a show. It's not a oh, oh, program. Okay. It is a it is a program that we're <clears throat> offering to the schools, and and uh, about two hundred schools are signed up so far uh, to take a vet to school day, and all of it simply entails is uh, taking a veteran, asking a veteran to come to your classroom and talk to the kids, tell them his stories. Uh, I've had. Um, I was a bit skeptical uh, when they first came to me with the idea, and so I went up to Las Vegas, and I got the uh, the third graders in Las Vegas together, and I uh, mm -hmm. and I gave them a little talk, and I was happy to find out, by the way, that about thirty percent of them were big fans of mail call, and uh, and mm -hmm. most of the rest of them. Uh, knew me from shows like Toy Stories and The Simpsons and Family Guy and things like that. This Take a uh, Veteran to School program uh, didn't work very well with uh, Charles Whitman. <laughs> uh, well, Charles Whitman had a little bit of a hang up there. Uh, from that book, Charles, Suppository Charles, Building, sir. <laughs> Charles insisted on bringing his fucking rifle. <laughs> he certainly Some did. You just can't get there without their rifle. He's got to have their rifle. But Outstanding. <laughs> our veterans will not bring their rifle. No, these no. Are, these are level-headed, uh, uh, very intelligent veterans. Anyway, uh, 
uh, I talked to the kids in the third grade up at Las Vegas, and then after I, I finished my little spiel, I, I opened it up for questions, and I, I was expecting a, a sprinkling of hands uh, when I asked for questions, but uh, every, almost every hand in the audit, auditorium went up, so uh, they were very enthusiastic about it. I had one kid that asked me a question about his uncle had been in Somalia. Could I explain that to him? Uh, there was another kid, uh, well, a bunch of kids actually asked questions about Vietnam. Hmm. How come people spit on the, the veterans and the soldiers when they came back from Vietnam? How come the war was so unpopular? Um, I was able to explain to them that uh, the media was doing exactly what they, the, the communist liberal media was doing exactly what they were doing now, and they were lying to the American people, uh, uh, and, and they had the American people convinced that we were losing the war in Vietnam, that we were losing, uh, we were sending young men over to die. Uh, for no reason, for no good reason. And uh, the liberal media, by the way, is doing that again right now. But anyway, uh, these veterans are falling by the wayside, boys, and we're losing the World War II veterans and, and Korean veterans mm. by the droves now. And we need to go and take good, great stories to the graves with them. So why not, for show and tell, take a vet to school? That's a pretty cool idea. I like it. it works, Opie and Anthony, it works for the vets, too. It makes them feel better. It of course. It makes them feel needed. You know, they get to air their, well, their, their feelings. But anyway, it, it works both ways. It's a good program. Arlie, I got a question for you off the subject. We, we, which yeah, we will. Absolutely. I, I just reading something here, and it's very interesting to me, and I didn't know it. Uh, it said you did study drama at the University of Manila in the Philippines. And it said that Coppola cast you in Apocalypse Now while filming in the area? But, yeah, yeah. What did you do in Apocalypse Now? I was a helicopter pilot. Yeah, I did not, not fucking know that. That's because I'm young and handsome back then. <laughs> <laughs> but you're actually... That's you're, why I had jet black hair. I was built like a stud. Are, what <laughs> scene are you in? Are you in when they're playing uh, Shall We Dance? Is that I this? was a helicopter pilot uh, while they uh, were... Uh, uh, Duvall was talking about Charlie don't surf. <laughs> right. It was uh, I, my chopper, and I flew in and blew up a bridge where there was a car, car crossing the bridge. I remember yeah, that. Yeah. yeah so and, it, and and it was also assistant technical advisor of the show. Oh yeah. my God! <laughs> so I was uh, involved with uh, that show. Uh, uh, Apocalypse Now is not one that I, I'm very proud of because every Vietnam veteran in the world hates the Apocalypse Now because it made us look like a bunch of real nitwits to the dopers and, and yeah. druggies and idiots, you know. However, uh, I was there and I did need a paycheck, and so <laughs> I was on board. I love uh, I love Mail Call. It's a great show. Uh, we're changing that around. We're uh, uh, the History Channel there again came to me uh, about last of uh, last year, at last of '06, and said we need to make some adjustments. Uh, it's a good show, but we've got a hundred episodes in the can. When the history, when uh, cable channels get a hundred episodes of a show in the can, it's time to start looking around for something else. So um, we have uh, we're shooting in HD now. We're shooting one hour shows. Uh, we uh, have changed the format around uh, a little bit, made some adjustments. It's hmm. just, and we we have now named it Trigger Time, and it's uh, it's a very it's a nice dressed up version of Mail Call is all of it. And you're gonna uh, you're still gonna blow some shit up, right? Oh, we're gonna blow shit up that you wouldn't believe. <laughs> Absolutely, that's what I like seeing. <laughs> yeah, our our thoughts are uh, if you if you can't drive it, fly it, shoot it. You blow it up, plain and simple. I mean, come on. <laughs> One of my favorites was when uh, you were in the tank, driving the tank around uh, and running over the watermelons. I think. <laughs> yeah, that was uh, that was fun. They they actually they actually set the watermelons up the first time, and I actually made it all the way through the obstacle course of watermelons without breaking any. Mm -hmm. And 
And so the next trip around, uh, my my director producer Rob Lahani, my director drew, producer and friend Rob Lahani said well, that wasn't very interesting, Gunny. Why don't you run over them? And I said, well, shit, okay, that's what I'll do. <laughs> and that time when I came through, why well, I, I maneuvered to the point where I ran over about half of them, I think. <laughs> then I ran through a bale a, a stack of uh, straw. Yeah. It was an interesting day. That was uh, one of our, geez, uh, that was one of our very first shows. You, you've you been watching for quite a while. Oh, for a long about time. Five years ago. Why don't you drive that Jeep across that lake with the uh, tarp? And, oh, yeah, uh, we, uh, we sunk that Jeep, you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we accidentally sunk it. We were supposed to, that was supposed to come off without a hitch. And we got ready to pull that. It was a, it was a lake out in the... Just a few, a uh, few miles from the house here, and we got ready to come out, and uh, the we we uh, took the old tire tire the tarp. We put it in four wheel drive, and the bank was a little bit steep, and of course it was wet and slippery. So when I started coming up the bank, what happened was the damn front tires wrapped the cameras oh. up around the tires, and it killed the engine. And then uh, the shit started sink, slowly, slowly uh, sliding back into the damn lake. And we sunk the damn Jeep. <laughs> oh, well. Shit happens, right? Yeah, yeah. All, all the time. <laughs> hey, Arlie, do you have any East Coast plans, too? Because you, I'm, I'm Jim. I'm in the studio a lot. But when you came in, I, I was away, and I'm very annoyed. Oh. Oh, well. I'm very hurt. Next time, you're going to have to be a bit more prompt, aren't we, Jim? Well, no, I was out of town. I was in Pittsburgh. I, I wish oh, I wasn't. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. Okay. You were out doing, taking care of other business. Oh, yeah, yeah, I was working. Yeah, he, uh... Okay. He missed uh, our lead. You were prosting, prostituting yourself in Pittsburgh. What the hell were you doing in Pittsburgh, anyway? <laughs> I'm a stand-up comedian, so I was, I was fucking, uh -huh. in a mediocre fashion, trying to entertain people, and okay. I was very... I've done that myself. I, I, I went into that I did most of the comedy clubs in LA before I decided to do movies oh we got a comedian <laughs> you did stand up yeah I did stand up laugh you twinkle toed communist I, cocksucker I did any fucking thing to make a buck <laughs> I was I was starving I was Marine Corps retired me and, and I, I my retirement check was humble <laughs> And and you couldn't live on it, so I had to figure something out. And I didn't have a good education, so I went up to L.A. and I, I, I wrote a script, and I started doing the comedy clubs. I did it for about a year. Oh, wow. Do you rem remember any of the jokes you told back in the day? I would love to hear one. No, I just told stories, stories. about my experiences, you know? Yeah. Did the crowds and, like them? Uh, huh? Did the crowds enjoy them? Oh, yeah, yeah, I got some laughs. The guys had me back. I mean, I was pretty popular. <laughs> I was doing really good, you know? And then uh, one one night, a buddy, but I was still living in in, in the YMCA, and my buddy uh, uh, came and told me, hey, Lee, guess what? They're shooting Vietnam War shoes. They're going to shoot them over in the Philippines. You should go try it out. And so I packed my humble little sea bag, went down to... Uh, went down to George Air Force Base, which is local here, and uh, I took went, flew over to the Philippine Space Available and uh, and uh, got involved. Now, yes. Is this and you were doing... Thing you know. I'm sorry. When were you doing comedy? Was this the late, late, late 70s? <clears throat> it was early 70s. Oh, wow, man. 1971, 72. You were doing stand-up in 70... How great... Did you ever see, like, uh, I guess you did the Comedy Store on Sunset... Um, Man, I and I guarantee you, nobody heckled me. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Did you remember seeing guys like Pryor or anybody else like that work out? Yeah, I, I knew most of the guys. Wow. How cool was that? That's something. That is amazing. I, was, yeah. I had no idea. Yeah, they weren't even very famous back in those days, you know? Sure, sure. But, but anyway, it was cool. It was, uh, it was an interesting experience, and it, uh, it was basically a step in my life, a stepping stone for me. And it really paid off, and it worked out. And, and if you watch uh, shows like uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, mm -hmm. uh, I write most of my own stuff. And I rewrite everything if it's if there's no if there's no goddamn jokes, boys. I got to rewrite. <laughs> you know? Well, there was a beautiful, funny. Even in Full Metal Jacket, there was such 
a, 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 a liquid delivery. It was really perfect, and it was funny in a really like harsh, barbaric way. The dialogue you had. I wrote. I, I wrote all of the, everything I said in Full Metal Jacket. I wrote. It was. It was really great. The, uh, That's my kind of stuff. You know, it's just uh, that was the kind of stuff that I would do on when I was doing the stand-up the, routine. You know, the one thing that kills uh, me and Jimmy constantly is how you hold the donut yes. when you pick it up out of uh, Private Pile's <laughs> footlocker and well, you're holding it like it's a piece of disgusting shit. <laughs> well, the the way I described it was I should hold it as though it were a disease. <laughs> I didn't want to get it too close to my face. You know? <laughs> and you know what's great? That's it, perfect. When you first see it, before the audience sees it, you go, what? The fuck is that? <laughs> like, it, it, people think it's going to be an explosive device, and it's a fucking <laughs> a donut. <laughs> <laughs> but that was funny shit, wasn't it? Oh, was hell God. yeah. Hilarious. I mean, it's, uh, it's kind of a, a bit dark. Yeah, but a bit. It's extremely funny. I mean, uh, you look like the kind of guy, and this is a line that I came up, and it was my favorite line in the show. And it was, you look like the kind of guy that would fuck a person in the ass and not even have the goddamn common courtesy to give him a reason. <laughs> common courtesy. That would and, and that's the way drill instructors talked. And they still talk like that. But back in my time, it was, uh, it was more, uh, descriptive, you mm -hmm. might add. I mean, sure. uh, I mean, you got, uh, I wrote lines in the show like, God has a heart on for Marines. Good Lord, that, that's almost that's so descriptive. You can always almost visualize. Yeah, that, you know. <laughs> hey, did you ever... that's really nasty. <laughs> and I was waiting to get struck dead after I wrote that line, but it didn't happen. God has a sense of humor. Then, hey, did you that's ever think of thing. doing? I'm sorry to interrupt you. Did you ever think of doing? Because you really have an interesting life, and obviously you're a funny guy, and you you can talk about anything. Like a one man show of some sort, where you're just kind of sitting there, telling stories about your life, whether they're military or about your father. I mean, I think that would be really funny and very interesting. Well, uh, I want to write the book, and and uh, I've never thought about doing the show. Well, I've, I've thought about it, but but I I just don't think it would be good. But I, I would have to be animated. It would have to be uh, visual. You know what I'm saying? But but I'm going to write the book. But I'm shit. This is not over with yet. I got ways to go yet. Before I write the <laughs> He's book, not ready. You know? <laughs> I, and I, I have some pretty evil, nasty shit to say about my father. So you know, I better wait until he dies. I figure. You know? <laughs> yeah, we got a lot. Wow. Me out of the will, man. I, I won't get the uh, my share of his. Eight hundred dollars that he's got. <laughs> <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, yeah, I plan on writing a book. Uh, guys, let's get back to my my project here. Take Can a veteran to school about it for just a minute. Sure, sure. sure. Take a veteran uh, to school. Take a vet to school, and you know, there's a lot of schools that are signed up out there right now. Uh, we've got about 200 uh, nationwide that are signed up for Take a Vet to School. If they can't find it, if the kids can't find a vet, I'll, I'll find one for them. Uh, and all they have to do if uh, the school wants to get involved, or if you're a little third grader, fifth grader, whatever, and you want to get involved, all you have to do is uh, go to the uh, go to uh, the computer and go to veteran dot com, and it will take you right to the website. To hit good folks over at the History Channel will will be more than happy to send out a little packet that explains everything that you need to know to get involved with this program. Okay, so there we go. I got it out. Fantastic. Now we mess around, guys. And also, I'm going to give out your website, too. Your website, which has a lot of uh, the information for you on it. rleeermy.com. rleeermy. Let me spell that for people. It's R-L-E-E-E-R-M-E-Y.com. rleeermy.com. Yeah, I'm not one of those actors that hides or keeps a low profile. <laughs> If you want to find me, you can find me, and uh, and generally you can find me in uh, in one in an airport uh, near you because I travel all the damn time. It seems like I'm on the airplane probably three days a week. I'm heading out in a few more days. I'm going to uh, 
uh, Pitts, uh, Pittsburgh. Oh wow! And mm-hmm. we're going to we're going to work with the good folks at the History Channel on uh, the Take a Vet to School Day. Then I come back. I've got one day off, and I had to. I head to Okinawa and Japan. Wow. I do that every year. I go to Okinawa and Japan, and I, I speak, and I'm the guest of honor. Uh, this year, I'm, I'm invited to speak at 15 birthday Marine Corps birthday balls over there. By the way, folks, November the 10th is the Marine Corps birthday. We are 331 years old this year, so make sure you celebrate. All right. Uh- R. Lee, hold on one second. We got Bill from Cleveland on the line. Bill, you're on with R. Lee Ermey. R. Lee, uh, uh, you're, you're a great American, and uh, with the story you were just talking, or they were mentioning on the donut uh, in the, the scene in the donut? movie, uh-huh. we had uh, a similar instance uh, being in basic training. We had a surprise inspection. We had a bit of uh, candy and snacks. One guy put it in his foot locker. He took the rap for everybody, and and they just went absolutely ballistic when they found this stuff in his foot locker. Oh, absolutely! Uh, See, nobody under uh, most civilians that have never been there and done that really don't understand the importance of diet uh, to a drill instructor. I mean, he's trying to mold and shape these people into into uh, finely honed machines, Marines, and and here you got this kid that's already a, a bit overweight. He's a disgusting fat body, <laughs> and the son of a bitch is sneaking chow into the barracks, and he's trying to slim this guy down. Uh, it's, um, it's, uh, it's, so it's a big, big to-do, right? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> And, and once you're once you're removed from it, uh, you can think back and say, all that uh, all that stuff they tried to beat India was was for your own good. Well, and then you can you can also see the humor in it <laughs> after oh, it's over with. Absolutely. All right, yeah, Bill. Because I mean, I owed my drill instructor a million step ups. We had a step up uh, board outside his his Quonset hut. And I owed him a million step-ups. And when everybody else sat down for reading and writing period in the evening, I would show up to his doorstep and start doing step-ups. When I left boot camp, I still think I owed him like something like 250,000 step-ups. But when you look back on it, you think, Wait a minute, here I owed this guy a million step-ups. There's no possible way that anybody could ever do a million step-ups. <laughs> Shit, you'd kill yourself. But this guy, that's what he awarded me for what I've screwed up, and he awarded me a million step-ups. Holy dog shit. <laughs> but, uh, but you look back on oh, it, and ready? you see the humor, and you understand yep. after after you finish up and when you look back on it why the humor was necessary, because the stress of uh, recruit training is so over the top, is so tremendous and so immense that if there isn't some kind of a a comic relief there, if there's not some kind of a uh, opening uh, where you can where you can actually let your mind laugh or have a moment of laughter, you're dead. Fuck you! Would you would drive yourself crazy? You yeah. Know? Well, you know, so, uh, so it has a. There's a reason for it, and most drill instructors have great senses of humor. So uh, uh, anybody's uh, pooly that's getting ready to go to boot camp, just remember your drill instructor has a great sense of humor, and tell them, by the way, that <laughs> you know the gunny and you get special treatment. You know, it was a, a great bet. a great part of that too is when you when you said, "Shall are you allowed to eat jelly donuts?" And Private Pyle tried to explain it because you, you said, why not? And he said, because I'm too heavy, sir. And you hit him with, because you're a disgusting fat body. But he tried to soft soap it. Like, yeah. Uh, I I've... plumped up a bit in recent weeks. <laughs> yeah. And I was thinking, that you look back on it, it always cracked me up. Uh, it was a, a compliment from the drill instructor because nobody, I mean, drill instructors don't compliment any damn body, right? But a compliment from a drill instructor is like when Private Pyle 
was actually, they realized that he could actually hit the target, he could actually hit the bullseye. Mm-hmm. And and the drill instructor came up and said, well, we found finally found something can, that you can do, didn't we, Private Pile? <laughs> You're not as fucked up as I thought you were. <laughs> well, right then, the, drill, the private chest puffed puffs up, you know, and he's all proud. That is a compliment from the drill instructor. You're not as fucked up as I thought you were. Yeah. You're still <laughs> shit, but you're not, you're not you're not as much shit as I thought you were. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I want that hit so spotless, uh, spick and span, spotless and square, uh, squared and away as the Virgin Mary herself would be proud to go in there and take a dump. Now, Exactly. You, Period. That's another one of those visual things. Yeah. And oh, boy. Combo. But Full Metal Jacket was just full of and stuff like that. You know, and it, uh, uh, it, that's what yeah. set, set Full Metal Jacket aside from all the other shows of that era. And I was, I was and allowed to, I was given the gift of period? rewriting the show with Stanley Kubrick, Stan the Man. And uh, I, I, in my mind, I was saying, this is the opportunity of a lifetime. This is the opportunity of my lifetime, and I better not screw uh, this up. And we worked hard on this show. Well, but, who, uh, it really paid off, guys. Who would have known better than you? <laughs> Absolutely. Arlie Ermey. Uh, thanks so much, man, for uh, for giving us a call. And uh, remember, take a veteran to school. Hey, it's always fun to play with you guys. I always, I always love it when I come on. So uh, thank you very much for, you know, God bless you. I, we couldn't ever get the word out if it wasn't for good, conscientious citizens like you guys. Well, like Open the caller said. Your airway so we could do this, you yeah. know. So thank you very much for helping us pass the word on this. It's, uh, I think it's a great program. I think it has tremendous merits. I think that the youth of this country, uh, across this country, Country, oh need gosh. to need to know history if they don't uh, they you know we're is. destined to repeat yeah. history so we let's done. let's let the vets go into the oh. schools and let's let them tell the, the kids their stories absolutely and these are smart vets now they 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 know how to gear their little talk to uh 12 yeah, twelfth uh, graders, and they can talk. Gonna to go in there and guard. just start talking about raking people <laughs> into pieces with their fifty <laughs> cows, <laughs> cutting their heads off, horrifying no, no, them. These are veterans that, that actually can uh, adjust, and, and they 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 know how to answer the young people's questions, and they they don't swear either. I'll, uh, so, yeah, I'll be right. Yeah, back. these are cleaned up veterans. Here we got, you know. That's great. That's but, great. Uh, uh, we need to get involved. Like the caller said, you're a great American. You're tireless when it uh, comes to uh, uh, putting yourself out there and uh, you're taking care of the veterans and uh, educating people. You're just uh, an amazing guy, Mr. Ermey, and it's a pleasure to uh, talk to you. Good luck with uh, everything you're doing. The uh, the new mail call, I guess, uh, uh, there's some of the old episodes available on DVD at history.com. And uh, a whole new season uh, revamped a bit. Uh, looking forward to seeing it. Yeah, uh, first part of the year. We're talking March or April. The new show will be coming out, so everybody needs to tune in. Give me a give me a shot at it. Give me a chance, okay? Absolutely. Uh, I, I bet you. I bet you'll like it. We'll hook you up. And uh, Semper Fi, guys. God bless you. Thank Semper you. Semper Fi, Mr. Ermey. Have a great rest of the day, boys. All All right. Right. Take care of yourself. Uh, absolutely. Bye now. Bye bye. There he goes. God damn. Yeah. That guy's amazing, isn't he? Of course he is. Guy's just And you know what it is? You know what's also great about him? He goes to uh he goes to uh, the, the USO, he visits the troops everywhere, and they treat that guy like he is still a marine and still like their drill sergeant. He's like a father figure to these marines. They I've seen uh shows where he shows up at bases and they all got smiles on their face. They want to talk to him, you know. They want to be around this guy. My dad loves him. My dad was yeah. in the Marine Corps. My dad was a drill sergeant in the Army. He loves our Lee Army because he represents them like a fucking a man. He's like a real yeah. man's representation He's, of... He is. He's like the perfect example of what a Marine should be. So when he, he goes around to all these locations, and he's been over there. He's been to Iraq and uh, uh, hung out with the, the troops over there. They just have this respect for this guy yeah. as a Marine, you know? And uh, it's great to see. And the guy just doesn't stop. 
he's constantly doing shit for uh, the troops and uh He's he's a fantastic guy, man, and oh. and just how entertaining is he to to watch and and talk when he talks about Full Metal Jacket, just saying some of those lines. Who fucking knew he was a stand-up comic? Two minutes. Yeah, yeah. Oh. That's the last thing you would think Arlie Ermy has has done in his career. Yeah, stand up. Being a stand up comic. Two Jews walk into a bar. <laughs> then they occupied it. <laughs> <laughs> fucking Arlie Army doing stand up comedy. An empty boat. <laughs> First fucking heckler. Choke yourself. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is that? A uh, 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 whoopee cushion. <laughs> 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 Holy dog shit. <laughs> because I'm too heavy, sir. Because you do predictable Polish jokes, private <laughs> pile. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> oh, <laughs> fucking give anything to see old stand-up footage of him. Oh, my God. And that was like right after he got out, I guess. So he was probably all cut up and everything. Yeah. Just looking like a Marine. Salty. <laughs> you will laugh at me. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> He must have been a treat. <laughs> a treat. Yeah. Well, there he goes. He's doing his take a vet to school day. Jesus. This will be our animated section about the My Lai Massacre. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Notice the little girl running after, after Asian Orange has been on her back. <laughs> we put in a funny voice. <laughs> that little photo, <laughs> <laughs> the little the little fook girl running down the uh, running down the street with napalm on her back. <laughs> now, third graders, this is Bugs Bunny throwing a hat into a helicopter on apocalypse. Now, watch the soldier burn. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> that pontoon up her ass! <laughs> How fucking great is that? He was in in, in apocalypse. Now, he was. I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to pop that on now to you know. At least get a good screen cap of that one. And I remember the scene. It, it was the guy mm -hmm. shot the bridge, and uh, Duvall went, ah, good shot. Oh, you a case of beer for that one. I think yeah. that was the case of beer for that one shot. Yeah, it was right in front of a vehicle, and the vehicle just kind of launches up in the air and uh, flies into the into the water. Who knew that was him? Uh, he's been in every war movie. Who are we kidding? It's funny that they didn't like fucking, uh, they didn't like uh, Full Metal Jack. I mean, uh, Apocalypse Next, they thought it portrayed the fucking soldiers as druggies. Yeah. And fuck-ups. It was a weird time for Vietnam movies uh, back then when that came out, uh, when Apocalypse first came out, because it wasn't really you, like any Vietnam movie. Everyone was fucked up. There wasn't any people that ever got through it and kind of just moved on with their lives. Everyone was portrayed as being fucked up. So that movie, everyone was fucked up. They're yeah. on drugs. No one knew who was in charge. Who's in charge? I don't know. I thought you were on the bridge. They're yelling at each other and just firing uh, into the air. but uh, And then after a while, with like um, a Full Metal Jacket, they kind of started getting into where it was just another war. And, you know, there were people that got fucked up and people that made it through. And uh, it made it a little more realistic. And then Platoon, the same thing, you know? Platoon was fucking great. But I still, my favorite part of Apocalypse Now is the last half hour when Brando is just fat and in the shadows, and the critics hate it, but it just made me so... This obese man is just improv and they're filming it. This is great. <laughs> yeah. Like, fatso. <laughs> fat load of shit. <laughs> Refused to do anything to help Coppola, who revived him. <laughs> yeah. Ungrateful fat cunt. Breaking down the door to eat ice cream. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Coppola, they didn't want him for the Godfather. They wanted no part of him. They would have rather have cast fucking Eric Nagel as the Godfather. <laughs> Fucking Warner Brothers. They wanted no part of Brando. Coppola makes them put him in. Yeah. And he sticks it right down Coppola's throat in Apocalypse Now. He's a to be total douche. What an asshole. <laughs> Fucking what an asshole. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I love it, it just that. Well, I guess I guess the vets don't like it though because it's it doesn't really it's not realistic. Right. It's sort of a weird psychedelic version of what you think that war would be. But uh, the uh, the ones that, then they started getting as, as the war got further away, and they got more info, and you saw that these guys were coming that came back. Some of them became owners of businesses and shit. Then it kind of became more realistic. Yeah. And I think Platoon was Platoon was probably one of the best Vietnam movies uh, made as far as uh, realism goes. I think my favorite moment in Platoon, or what I mean, besides Sergeant Barnes, is when uh, the guy when uh, uh, fucking Keith David is fucking saying that Charlie Sheen's a crusader. And he goes, Rich, fu always fucking over the poor, always has, always will. Yeah. I love that. <laughs> the finest actor.
Makes me very happy. Yeah. All right, well, movie quotes. I have yep. to tinkle.